Ladies and gentlemen, welcome from the Netherlands and from the US, Michigan. Today we're hosting a new webinar on the 25th of June. It is a beautiful day outside, it's warm inside. So let's get started and I'd like to welcome everybody. The topic of today is emerging issues in cybersecurity. A quick start guide to ISO UN EC standards within automotive. This is because there's an initiative going on between the Netherlands and Michigan. And we actually like to share a short video about it to you. The future of mobility is here. It changes the way we travel, we drive, or walk. It changes the way we think about cybersecurity, about public safety, or about public transport. Tomorrow's solutions are already being pioneered today. The Netherlands and the United States are bringing the brightest minds and the most forward-thinking companies together. And together, our industries and engineers are building a better future for all of us. We are making smart mobility your business. So as you can see today, we have a very interesting topic, automotive smart mobility. And because of the initiative of the Netherlands and Michigan, we'd like to give a warm welcome to André Haspels. André is the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United States. Sorry, I'll start again. I don't know if I was muted or not muted, but these things happen in a new uh, form. I was starting by saying uh, good morning and, and, and good afternoon to everybody from Washington and uh, to welcome you all the whole group in the Netherlands, in the United States, and also uh, Lieutenant Governor Jill Christ. The, uh, the promotional video that we just saw uh, illustrates and underscores our, our, our Dutch-US uh, collaborative goals in the realm of infrastructure and smart mobility. And collaboration between the Netherlands and the United States at large, and of course with Michigan specifically, uh, is very strong, uh, not only based on the historic ties, uh, we have more than 550,000 uh, Americans in, of Dutch descent in, uh, in Michigan, but also based on the realities, the economic realities of today. We signed an MOU uh, in April 2018 by the former Michigan governor uh, at the TomTom Tom headquarters then in the Netherlands, uh, also in attendance of the US ambassador in the Netherlands. And since then, since the signing of the MOU, we, uh, we developed various activities, uh, endeavors, uh, and of course, the highlight of this year was supposed to be our first innovation mission planned for the, uh, the North American International Auto Show uh, in Detroit uh, with a strong Dutch pavilion and an innovation pavilion as we had foreseen it. Uh, well, we all know the reasons why uh, it can't take place, but we also all know that we are looking for new options uh, to continue our cooperation and to keep the momentum that we have started in our cooperation. So that's why um, we had the development of a webinar, se webinar series on the cybersecurity issues as a, as a lead up towards the next innovation mission. Uh, the webinar of today is an example of that. It is hosted by uh, Riscure and Secura from the Netherlands. I'm very proud of that. And the following webinar is hosted on September the 22nd already by Grimm uh, in, the US, in the USA. During the, uh, the RSA IT and security conference in San Francisco, in March last year at Grimm's Car Hacking Village, the, the Netherlands and MEDC successfully facilitated the meeting between Grimm, Car Hacking Village and cyber companies from the Dutch delegation. And the webinar series is a direct result from that meeting. Because security is quickly becoming an increasingly important topic in the automotive uh, domain. And our aim is to develop and position automotive cyber as a Netherlands US key theme at the North American International Auto Show in 2021 in Detroit. And I have confidence that we will be able to organize uh, it then and that we will be able to participate in. And relevant questions such as what does security mean? How do you include security in your design? And for which components is security relevant? We will learn more in the upcoming hour and the next webinar 
uh, in this series about these important questions. I'll now hand over to Lieutenant Governor Jill Christ II. So again, thank you very much for attending and we look very much forward to continue and expand our collaboration with our partners in the Netherlands and the US and Michigan specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you, André, for the welcome words. So now let's move on to Garling Kilchrist, the Lieutenant Governor of Michigan. Garling, can you please unmute yourself and share your opening remarks with us? All right. Uh, good morning from Michigan, everyone. Uh, my name is Garland Gilchrist II. I am the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Michigan, and I'm honored to participate in this conversation. And the state of Michigan is honored to be a collaborator uh, with the Netherlands in all things technology, all things mobility, and all things forward looking. I want to thank uh, Ambassador Hospitals for uh, his welcome remarks today. I was honored to be able to meet him as well as uh, Minister Kaiser uh, back in uh, January of this year at the Consumer Electronics Show. And I look forward to continuing to deepen the relationship between the Netherlands and the state of Michigan, which has a rich heritage of, uh, of uh, people of Dutch descent um, who have called Michigan home for generations. So I'm proud to build on this. I also want to thank everyone who has joined this conversation. This is a really important um, conversation that we're having uh, today. Uh, all of us certainly were disappointed that the 2020 uh, North American International Auto Show, one of the biggest events that happens uh, in our nation when it comes to mobility and technology, uh, was scheduled to take place to June in Detroit, but it was canceled due to COVID-19. And I know that the Netherlands was looking forward to having uh, a major presence at the uh, at the uh, auto show. But nevertheless, with the development of this webinar series, we're gonna be able to maintain momentum leading up to next year's auto show. And I'm very excited to help kick this off. These webinars will also help us showcase the state of Michigan and the Netherlands' vital partnership. Because Michigan is home to many Dutch companies, including an offer roof systems, TomTom, uh, whose roof I got to visit at the CES show with Ambassador Pete Polkstra, who is also um, a Michigander and used to be serving uh, our Congress, uh, Bissell, Marcant, and others, all of which have helped to invest nearly $250 million in our state over the past six years alone. Michigan and Netherlands also share a very strong working relationship when it comes to automotive mobility and technology issues, including a memorandum of understanding that reiterates our shared commitment to cooperation in automotive issues and the deployment of innovative technology within that industry. We also have begun conversations about exploring how we can extend that MOU to include issues of climate change. Sharing research and knowledge between Michigan and the Netherlands in the development and deployment of, it, of intelligent vehicle transportation will also make our population safer and our modes of transportation more accessible and more efficient. Already, Michigan is helping to lead conversations around the future of cybersecurity and how our automotive and defense industry assets can play a role in this evolution because ultimately the cybersecurity industry is one that touches pretty much every other sector of our technologies as we become more connected and as the technology evolves. Cybersecurity has already proven to be vital to our growing automotive and mobility industries, our critical infrastructure systems, connected medical devices, and the internet of things. In Michigan, innovation and manufacturing are in our blood and in our DNA. For generations, our state has been the epicenter of technological discoveries and mobility solutions. After all, we did put the world on wheels. But today we're recognized around the world as the undisputed leader in the nation's automotive landscape. Since 2009, 25% of the automotive investments made in North America have been made in the state of Michigan. 96 out of the top 100 automotive suppliers in North America have a presence in Michigan, with 71 of them having their headquarters here. Michigan is home to more automotive manufacturing facilities than any other state, and Michigan is home to nearly one fifth of all United States auto production, more than any other state in the United States of America. As we look to the future of the cybersecurity industry in particular, it's even clearer than ever that Michigan has a critical role to play in the embedded cyberspace, thanks to our unique ability to address connections between commercial autonomous vehicles and the mobility sector, and the evolution of the defense industry. Michigan also has the highest concentration of engineering talent in the nation, and I'm biased because I am a software engineer uh, by training, along with several nationally recognized and accredited universities, equipping us with the skilled workforce and research expertise needed to drive the next generation 
of our industry's innovation. As cybersecurity companies around the globe are finding themselves facing a shortage of highly skilled and highly qualified talent to support their work, Michigan is taking proactive steps to prepare our young people and our mid-career professionals to meet these cyber talent needs. This includes working to prepare our workforce for the changing needs of the mobility, cybersecurity, and defense sectors, especially in growing tech talent and software roles. By supporting innovative initiatives, like the one we rolled, we initiated this year called the Michigan Reconnect Program, we will not only give everyone a tuition-free educational pathway to a good paying job, we will continue to promote the state of Michigan as a home for opportunity for cybersecurity and mobility companies that are creating a whole new set of workforce needs and possibilities. Michigan is also home to clusters of automotive manufacturers, suppliers, research and development facilities, top rank universities, ancillary services, generating an atmosphere of collaboration and heightened productivity to lead the world to the next generation of cybersecurity and mobility. Thanks to this, our extensive university ecosystem, investing in future industry solutions, we are a national leader in our research and development focus with an enthusiastic curiosity and a willingness to push the boundaries and ensure the discoveries of the future are taking place right here in Michigan. We rank ninth in the United States for degrees awarded in computer science, engineering, and mathematics with more than 14,000 graduates in 2018. The University of Michigan, my alma mater, has several programs that are consistently top ranked nationally, including graduate and undergraduate engineering programs, a computer science systems graduate program, and an artificial intelligence graduate program, all of which will be really critical as our economy continues to evolve. In Michigan, we're home to the researchers, the coders, the developers, the mathematicians, the data scientists, the analysts who are developing innovative solutions to protect the security of our systems and personal data around the state, around the country, and around the world. And with the commitment from industry leaders, along with the innovative steps we're taking at the state level, including our newly created Michigan Office of the Future of Mobility. We will continue to lead the charge in developing the future of cybersecurity and mobility technology. Cybersecurity is an integral part of these efforts. And we look forward to our continued collaboration on these critical issues moving forward. We look forward to continuing today's important conversation with the next webinar in September, three days before my birthday, September 25th, by the way, where Michigan-based cybersecurity expert Grimm will also address additional topics about how the future of cyber will continue to evolve. The new CEO of the American Center for Mobility, Ruben Sarkar and Jen Tensdell from Grimm will be in attendance at this webinar. And just to close, I really see this as an opportunity for us to uh, make a future that works for more people. As we are in the midst of a global response to the coronavirus pandemic, um, this is calling to question so many aspects of our personal and professional lives, including the spaces and infrastructure that we share. And so as we think about, as we dream, and as we develop our solutions for transportation and mobility going forward, shared mobility now is going to have to look different. And I believe the innovations that will come from the collaboration between the state of Michigan and the Netherlands will lead to our state and the, and the Netherlands being leaders and defining what that shared mobility infrastructure will look like, how it will be safe in terms of not only reducing fatalities from a pedestrian standpoint, but also how it will be safe for people to share in the aftermath of COVID-19. So this, this is more critical than ever. And these questions are, are more important that we address them with all of the rigor and the energy that I know we always bring to the table. So thank you for being a partner, a collaborator, a co-conspirator, and an ally as we move into this bright future together. Thank you very much, Garlin, and also thanks, Andre. I think the opening words of both of you shared with us a very clear picture of this topic. Not only about the fact that the topic is hot, but it's also a very interesting topic because a lot of people and organizations are collaborating on this. Within the US and the Netherlands, there are a lot of companies and people working on this topic. And that's what's also shown today in the fact that we start with a series of webinars about the automotive standards. We have two excellent speakers today, Rafael from Riskure and Rasvan from Secura. Secura and Riskure are also collaborating companies here in the Netherlands and also in this partnership on this topic today. So before we start with the presentation with Rasvan, a few final remarks. Please note that if you have any questions, you can address them in the question box in GoToWebinar. We try to answer them at the end, but sometimes there's a lot of questions and we can't deal with all the questions in time. So we take them back with us and we'll get back to you later. 
And at the end of the webinar, there's a survey. It will be very much of interest to us, not only to improve the webinars for future topics, but also to make sure that we address the right topics within this collaboration platform. So together we learn, and as a collaboration initiative, our focus is to make the next steps happen in improving automotive and smart mobility security. For all participants, thanks a lot for attending. I would now like to give the floor to Rasvan, who will start speaking about the first topic, the impact of the automotive standardization with regards to the UN ECE standards. Rasvan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erwin. Thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, Indeed, the first topic will be related to the UNEC cybersecurity regulation for the automotive and the vehicle domain. First of all, a very brief introduction. I'm Rose Van Venter. I'm a senior security specialist for certification at Secura. And um, I'm in charge of uh, multiple certification and compliance programs at Secura. And among those is also the automotive um, compliance and certification. Moreover, I've been over the last couple of years involved actively in the activities of UNEC with respect to the development of the new upcoming cybersecurity and software updates regulations. And over the last um, year, a bit more than that, had practical experience in conducting several successful pilots in applying the concepts of those two new regulations in practice. So those elements will be described later in the presentation. Uh, to provide you with a bit of an overview on the agenda, of course, we'll start with a bit about the context of UNEC and the vehicle regulations and how those fit together in the international environment. Then we'll zoom in on a cybersecurity regulation. And finally, based on our lessons learned from several successfully conducted pilots, we'll talk about the impact, the expected impact on vehicle manufacturers and also the lessons learned, which could be useful for other OEMs that plan to apply the requirements of those regulations. Finally, of course, we will end up with the expected timeline of the regulation itself and what is next from a UNEC point of view. So, to get started, first of all, a couple of words about UNEC. Well, UNEC stands for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. You could remark that is a bit strange because of the word Europe. However, as we will see very shortly, UNEC is shortly a very international organization that spans across multiple continents. Within the UNEC, there are multiple working parties, and in particular, Working Party 29, called the World Forum for Amortization of Vehicle Regulations, is in charge of marketing various regulations applied on vehicles, on, on cars, buses, trucks, and so on. There are also some other working parties within UNEC for other various topics, such as noise, safety, autonomous vehicles, and so on. But for the purpose of this webinar, we'll, stay, we'll talk about the Working Party 29 in charge of vehicle regulations. Within this Working Party, there's a special task force uh, focused on cybersecurity and over-the-air issues, and this task force has been so far in charge of drafting um, uh, the, uh, the, the several um, uh, versions, the several draft versions of the cybersecurity regulation. Now, as I said, UNEC is a truly international organization which spans across multiple continents and includes in total 56 member states. As we can see in this slide, it covers most of Europe as well as a big part of Asia, but also North America, so the USA and Canada. About the USA and Canada, I will have also a remark on the follow-up slide regarding mutual recognition agreements um, uh, applicable to those two countries. Um, and anyway, in terms of regulations, um, how do automotive regulations work in practice? Well, there are multiple possible regulations available. And in fact, car manufacturers, whenever they want to place the vehicles on one of the UNEC governed uh, countries, which ask for those regulations, they have to fulfill with all, with all of those regulations in particular for a particular type of approval. Um, you, would, you might be wondering how does that work in terms of mutual recognition, because of course there are multiple regulations in multiple countries, so having to go through the same effort over and over again will be extremely costly and time consuming. But luckily there are several mutual recognition agreements in place for various groups of regulations, and one of the most famous of those agreements is called the so-called 1958 Agreement, which puts together a lot of countries, part of UNEC, that have decided to mutually accept the type of approval results from one country to another, which means that OEMs, uh, developers um, uh, and manufacturers of vehicles, have to certify their types in only one country, and then those types are approved and um, accepted in all the other countries that are part of this mutual recognition agreement. Now, how it works is that approval authorities in each country are, are the ones which have the power to certify a particular type, but very often those type approvals, uh, type approval um, uh, national authorities rely on so-called technical services, so specialized labs, to perform part or all of the testing work and assessment. But 
Zooming in into, sub, into security, well, um, uh, historically speaking, this has not been a topic that has been um, uh, several, uh, up to several years ago in the focus of UNEC. Um, the UNEC has been mostly focused on other topics such as safety, performance, noise of vehicles, and so on. So how come the shift towards security has been so much over the last couple of years? Well, modern vehicles are starting to get more and more connected. Nowadays, it's not only about a couple of wired interfaces and, 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 uh, and cables, which you can plug into the vehicle, but those modern vehicles have a lot of uh, interfaces and a lot of um, possible um, elements that can themselves be further connected. And that contains entertainment options, road navigation, maps, vehicle to vehicle, and so on. Vehicles are becoming a very huge part of the IoT. And that doesn't apply only to personal cars, but also to large-scale vehicles like trucks or buses, and even to trailers. Therefore, um, so uh, uh, the shift towards cybersecurity is becoming more and more important. So far, the focus has been strongly on the functionality and, and the performance part of those smart features. And that actually makes sense, because if you think about it, very likely nowadays you would not consider buying a car which, for example, doesn't have support for smart navigation, which will allow us easily to get from point A to point B, even if we don't know the route. Or probably you would not consider buying a car which has not a minimum set of interfaces. And by minimum, probably would think about uh, at least USB and Bluetooth. And finally, voice control, for example, for taking your calls and initiating calls, that's also something that is very likely expected out of a modern vehicle. And all of those interfaces, even though they're very uh, nice and very, very desired in a modern vehicle, they do come with a whole set of security risks because of the fact that they are connected to the vehicle and connected to the outside world through internet. Well, of course, the purpose of this webinar is not to go very deep into the technical security details of uh, the automotive domain, but long story short, all of those um, uh, smart either interfaces or ECUs or various ICs and, and, and products that are integrated into a car, they are most of the times directly connected to the vehicle internal network through CAN buses. So what that means is that if an attacker is being able to breach, for example, into the infotainment system or into the USB hub of a vehicle, they're not only hacking the USB hub, but they're opening a door throughout, uh, to the whole vehicle network, so potentially towards much more interesting and much more dangerous subsystems such as steering, braking, and so on. And this is why the vehicle security as a whole is very important and should be slowly taken more, into, more and more into account by vehicle manufacturers. Therefore, the need for creating those draft regulations, which are currently uh, in the face of, uh, of, uh, of, becoming, uh, of coming into force. So that being said, about the current state of regulations, well, as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, UNEC has had a couple of draft versions which have been circulated. And as the need is already there for those uh, regulations to go live and everyone acknowledge those needs, well, the, the current aim is to have um, early 2021, January preferably, as the first deployment date for those regulations. Uh, currently, as I mentioned, within UNEC, there's a task force on cybersecurity and software updates, and the aim is to introduce two new regulations, one for cybersecurity and one for software updates. For the purpose of this webinar, we'll mostly focus on the cybersecurity um, regulation, both, but both of those regulations are expected to come into force at the same time. In terms of the cybersecurity regulation, the scope of this regulation is quite large, and it doesn't contain only the, the, uh, the, the, the personal uh, passenger vehicle, but in fact, it, it spans over uh, regular cars, but also buses, also vehicles for the transport of goods, so trucks, uh, trucks and also trailers, um, as long as, in the latest version of, in the, of the regulation, as long as they contain at least one connected ECU. So the scope is big and it, it contains, uh, it uh, addresses a lot of um, uh, various car manufacturers and, and vehicle manufacturers in the world. But now let's spend a couple of minutes talking a bit about the contents of the cybersecurity regulation and what can someone expect to find inside once scrolling through this document. Well, as an overview, um, one of the most important things about the regulation is the fact that it treats not only the vehicle as, as an individual vehicle type, but it treats the, co the whole life cycle of the vehicle. So starting from the development part, all the way to, produ to, to production, maintenance, and also removal from service. So from that point of view, the requirements of the regulation on a high level, they address the vehicle, but also the whole process of designing, developing, and producing the vehicle. Moreover, um, uh, those, those process-related parts, they are 
put together into something called the Cybersecurity Management System, the CSMS, and that CSMS becomes an integrated part of regulation, which is mandatory in order to achieve compliance for individual vehicle types. Therefore, the main two parts of the regulation are the Cybersecurity Management System, CSMS requirements, and the vehicle type requirements. Talking about the CSMS uh, requirements, the Cybersecurity Management System, like mentioned before, this is focused mostly on the process part, so not vehicle bound, but vehicle independent. However, OEMs need to demonstrate compliance of their processes in order to be able to, on top of those, demonstrate compliance of a particular vehicle type. Now, the good part of it is that um, uh, OEMs need to demonstrate this compliance for the processes only once, and then as long as all the individual vehicle types are built on top of the same CSMS, that doesn't have to be repeated, but simply applied for each individual vehicle type. However, the, uh, uh, the, the, com the compliance of the, of the processes under the cybersecurity management system needs to be demonstrated and needs to be certified under a so-called certificate of compliance, which is issued once and then valid for three years for all of the vehicle types that are certified under that particular CSMS system. Well, at a high level, of course, um, uh, the CSMS particular requirements are, are quite many, but um, they could be split from a, from a high level point of view into several main topics. And those main topics are about security management processes around the development, production, and manufacturing of a vehicle, risk management, so including identification, assessment, and treatment of risks, uh, incident response, and finally, external supplier dependencies. So let's spend a couple of minutes on going a bit deeper into all of those categories, explaining what could someone find into those categories. From a management point of view, of course, that deals with the roles and responsibilities of a, a, a developer of vehicles. And of course, that needs to demonstrate that the awareness is there into the organization and everyone is fully aware of their role in the development of a vehicle. Furthermore, from the risk assessment, well, that's something quite straightforward and quite classic from, a, let's say, a security point of view. It deals with identifying, with, with the process of identifying all possible threats and risks to the vehicle, rating those risks, and furthermore, defining security controls in order to protect the vehicle against all identified risks. Going further, in terms of incident response, of course, that's also a very important topic. The car or the vehicle should not be protected only at the moment when it leaves the factory, but there should be a process which is very clearly defined in terms of how to react to newly identified incidents. And everyone should be aware of the responsibilities and roles in this process. And finally, supplier management. That's also a very important topic because modern vehicles, they're very much dependent on external suppliers. So being able to be fully in charge of what your suppliers are, are giving to you and being able to be fully um, in control of their own identifying vulnerabilities, it's also a key point. From a vehicle type requirements point of view, well, the story is relatively simple, even though the requirements are many, but the main question is, now that you have your processes in place and described and hopefully certified, how can you demonstrate that for each particular vehicle, you are building them in line with those processes? And that's the main question be be behind vehicle type assessment. Example of requirements would include uh, uh, classification of what risks have been uh, found in place and how the architecture of the vehicle itself addresses those risks. Now, moving further, from our conducted pilot projects, we did learn a couple of lessons about how does this new regulation impact manufacturers. And what we learned first is that all manufacturers are impacted in different ways based on a couple of factors, like their current awareness, the size of their organization and processes, the size of their external supplier dependencies, and ultimately, of course, the experience and size of their cybersecurity teams. There were a lot of points that we noticed during our conducted pilots, but some com com common topics of interest include the fact that very often currently available processes need to be slightly updated or tailored. Moreover, um, in, terms of, in terms of internal design dependencies, that's also a pretty common topic because changing a particular part of the vehicle or a process might introduce the need of changing others as well. And that's something that needs to be taken into account because furthermore, that relates also with suppliers. So it introduces a big dependency on the whole supply chain, which translates into a lot of time needed. So if I would summarize this whole into one uh, single element, be aware of the fact that whatever you change will very likely influence many other things. And therefore that will translate in a lot of time and, and, and budget that needs to be taken into account. 
Finally, the last part of my presentation deals with the expected timeline of this regulation. And well, as I mentioned in the beginning, the regulation is um, uh, designed and intended to go live, to go into force into early 2021. The current plan uh, within the UNEC is to make it mandatory for new vehicle types from July 2022. And well, in parallel with drafting the regulation itself, the UNEC is working together with some partners, among which Secura as well, in drafting some support documentation, which will help in preparing both technical services, labs, as well as vehicle manufacturers in meeting easier the requirements of the regulations. Thank you very much for the attention. Um, before I pass the floor to my colleague from, from Riskier, Rafael, um, one of the major questions about the cybersecurity regulation in itself is, well, the requirements, there are many. Sometimes they are written in a very, very flexible way. Therefore, a common question of manufacturers is, okay, how do I demonstrate my compliance? What do I have to do in practice? Of course, there are multiple ways and the regulation itself doesn't mandate for a particular way, but in practice, one very useful way to achieve compliance with a lot of requirements is by aligning your processes to the internationally recognized ISO 2144 standard. And Rafael here will uh, explain us a lot more about the contents and value of the standard. So Rafael, please take the floor. Thank you, Rasman, for your introduction. So my name is Rafael Boiscarpi, and I will now introduce the next session. I will introduce uh, what is this new standard ISO ACE 2144. Maybe a bit of words about me. So my role, I am a principal trainer and security specialist at Riskier. So I joined Riskier in 2013. And then at Riskier, what we do is we do, uh, we provide training, tooling, security evaluations, and consultancy on hardware and software solutions, among which we have automotive products. But also we deal with uh, secure elements, smart cards, uh, or software elements like uh, secure boots, trusted execution environments. Personally, I'm interested in embedded security. Uh, this might range from very sophisticated attacks like sidechain attacks, fault injection attacks. These are very sophisticated hardware attacks. But also, I am nowadays very much into automotive security because it's a relevant topic. And already, as Rasman introduced, this is becoming more and more important. And today, I will introduce this ISO ACE 2144 standard. Here, you have the agenda of the presentation. First, I will introduce what the standard is about. And then I will also emphasize some highlights about the standard. In particular, I will also emphasize the cybersecurity assurance levels, or CALs, and something about the process and continuous activities, and also about distributed cybersecurity requirements. Finally, I will also conclude this presentation with some takeaway notes. Let's start with an introduction to this new standard. So the ISO SAE 2144, I will refer to it from now on as 2144. This was already published in February 12th this year. At the moment, the status of it is a draft international standard. So this means that it's released, but it's not fully into force. There are some comments on finalization phase, and the expectation is maybe early this year, sorry, early next year, this already is the final standard. The standard cancels and supersedes this SAE J3061 standard. So this is a document about best practices in cybersecurity in the automotive domain. And this new 2144 standard, it's a joint effort between the SAE and ISO organizations. The standard defines cybersecurity activities within a V-model development cycle, which is very common automotive development. It is parallel and compatible with well-established practices, like, for example, this ISO 26262 about safety in automotive. But it's not just an extension. So there are fundamental differences that exist between this process, this framework, and current practices, like safety practices. And in particular, as Rasman already explained, this standard is very relevant for implementing UNEC regulations. It defines and describes the framework for implementing the cybersecurity management system. And in particular, if you have not fully adopted in your automotive company a cybersecurity management system yet, or if you're in this process, this is a great starting point because it gives you already a lot of guidance on what is required in order to fulfill with these regulations. You can find in the slides some links to the ISO website or the SAE organization, so the standard is actually the same. Let's talk about some features of the standard. The first one I would like to discuss is about compliance, and this is just, I think, a major topic. The upcoming regulation from UNEC will require to have compliance with the cybersecurity management system. And 
complying with this ISO standard actually serves as compliance with a cybersecurity management system according to UNDC. It's actually one of these main focus. So you can see in the slide, for example, this requirement and on point 7222 is from these GRBA working documents and specifically mentions that you need to comply with the cybersecurity management system, the processes need to manage cybersecurity and so on. So this is actually what 2144 is about. Another feature of the standard is that it covers the whole development process of automotive systems. In particular, it, it manages the cybersecurity risk through the full electronic electrical system development process from the very early concept through decommissioning, covering all the intermediate steps, concept phase, design, implementation, testing, verification, and also includes company support processes. So the standard is applicable to OEMs or supplier, basically to any automotive company that is doing electrical electronic systems. Another feature is that this standard is aimed to apply right away into best or common established processes. Here, there is a common process, which is a safety standard, for example, this ISO 6262. This is very widely deployed in the automotive industry. And as you can see here, it has certain structure. You can see a V shape. This is just to describe this V model of development. Let's compare these current standards, this 2662 latest edition, to this new 2144 standard. There's a section about terms, general considerations, same as earlier standards. Then this standard also defines how to do cybersecurity management. The other standard, for example, defines functional safety. So we have here a section for it. Then we have a part of cybersecurity activities for the concept phase, same as other standards. Then we have a section about the product development, what to do during this uh, electronic electrical system development. However, there is something new in this standard in ISO 2144, which is cybersecurity validation. I will describe this later when we do some highlights, but basically it's not enough anymore to just comply with the requirements according to this, to this 2144 standard. You also have to make sure that these requirements achieve the desired goal. So in other words, that your requirements actually make sense for this cybersecurity goal. Then the standard also has post-development activities, the same as previous standards, but there is a new activity, which we will also dive a bit deeper in some seconds, which is about cybersecurity incident response. This new standard introduces continuous activities. You need to be monitoring actively cybersecurity incidents. And if something happens, then this standard also introduces activities into your development process. We will describe this in some seconds. The standard also has, as other standards supporting processes, we have parts for describing the cybersecurity activities. It also has a specific clause for distributed cybersecurity activities. So how to deal with this complexity that Rasman already introduced in these UNEC regulations? How do we manage all these interactions for cybersecurity between OEMs, tier ones, these customer supply relationships? So there is also some guidance here in the standard, as well as there is this risk assessment part. So how do we make sure that we have a proper and sound risk assessment for cybersecurity activities? If we look at the other standards, like in safety, there is also some technical about this. Then there is also some annexes, which are maybe not requirements, but they are also important because they introduce some uh, ideas in order to fulfill these requirements. We will mention one about the CALs because it's very real. Then there is also different activities or differences with established practices in this 2144 standard. I wanted to highlight one one feature of the standard, which is about the processes, because cybersecurity threats evolve over time. Different to other activities, here for cybersecurity, we need to have processes that support re-evaluation of cybersecurity activities in coordination with incident response. What does this mean? If you look at the graphic, you can see, for example, in a 15-year lifespan, the evolution of computational power between the top rank supercomputer in 1995 and the computational power in 2010. And you can see that this is an exponential growth. Attackers for cybersecurity use this kind of tooling. So you can imagine that what is possible in 2010, it was not even uh, imaginable in 1995. An automotive system that has typically a lifespan between 10 and 15 years. So this is why you have to be monitoring continuously what is happening for cybersecurity and react accordingly. Just to give an idea of how this can impact, for example, sometimes there are researchers that would have some publications, and if, for example, this publication dismantles your ciphers in your systems, 
or if you explain how to attack remotely a car, then you, ha you might have a major incident in your processes, and then you have to reevaluate how your system should be modified, how to do risk mitigation. Sometimes this might happen because of accident. And this is something that then is different to establish practices because, for example, if an engineer accidentally leaks some keys, then suddenly your cybersecurity might be fully compromised and then you need to also react to this. So let's talk about some highlights of this 2144 standard so that you can see some things that are quite different to already established practices. The first one is about the scope. Rasmus already mentioned this. 2144 talks about cybersecurity. And the scope of cybersecurity is actually much wider than just safety or other common established practices in automotive. In particular, 2144 mentions the safety dimension, but also the finance dimension, operations, or privacy aspects. So if you are developing an automotive system that can pose a cybersecurity threat to any of these aspects, your customer might require compliance to this 2144 standard. Because just for giving an idea, if you have an EE system that contains assets like personally identifiable information, PII, this might make your system cybersecurity relevant, even if compromising the system does not mean direct physical harm to the driver of the system. Let's give an example. So here, I'm going to use this example to introduce also the cybersecurity assurance levels. Imagine that you're driving a car through a highway, and then you have an ECU, an electronic control unit, to pay the toll of this highway. So here in this system, maybe this is not safety relevant, but what happens if this system gets hacked? There is one aspect in 2144 introducing one of the annexes, which is these CAALs. The cybersecurity assurance levels define the rigor of cybersecurity activities to be done because this standard is quite big and maybe you don't need to do all the activities in the standard. If we take this example, like this telematics ECU for paying the highway toll, the asset would be the payment keys linked to the car user. Attack vector, if an attacker wants to compromise this, might be a remote attacker that tries to read the ECU keys for payment via some remote diagnostics of this ECU. And what would be the impact if such attack takes place? Would it be major, would it be severe? So this, you would have to do this assessment. And then this, for example, Annex already proposes a means to define how much cybersecurity activities we need to do. This is the tailoring that Rasman already introduced. So here, for example, in this case, we would have a network attack vector. It would be a remote attacker. And the impact, this is compromising payment keys. So this can be major or severe. This would need to be defined. But this would propose CAL4. If we have, sorry, if we have CAL4 level, then what does it mean? It means that 2144 allows to tune the cybersecurity effort according to this rating. So in other words, we started with this ECU that has network functions containing user payment data. Then a remote attack would have impact on privacy and financial aspects, maybe not directly on safety, but privacy and financial aspects. And in this standard, according to this annex, we would have a call for rating. What does it mean? Then the standard in this annex would propose the activities to do for cybersecurity. For example, to have advanced methods for product design, for testing, this should be reviewed by independent analysis, and so on. There are also other aspects, for example, about the process and continuous activities. In this 2144 standard, basically, it mentions that you shall monitor internal and external sources for cybersecurity information. And when you take this information, if you try a sheet and this should trigger a cybersecurity incident, this has to be mass for your system, then the standard already gives you guidance on what to do. In particular, you should mitigate the risk that you can use from the risk assessment in clause eight. And this would trigger some vulnerability management actions, which should also be done according to the standard. And you would give these actions according to some cybersecurity incident plan. So basically you have already quite some guidance on how to deal with these incidents. But I would like to stress once more that cybersecurity affects the whole recycle uh, model, including post-development. So it affects now the whole production cycle and also post-development. Finally, I would also like to stress that major difference from established practices is that now we are playing against an attacker. It's not a safety attack, so it's not a threat. It's not like a modern nature on unintentional attacks. Now we have targeted attackers, and these attacker capabilities change over time. So you need to constantly monitor and evaluate your cybersecurity.
And these triggers, the last highlight I wanted to have from 21 from 24, which is about distributed cybersecurity requirements. In particular, this standard imposes cybersecurity requirements throughout the whole chain. So for the OEM to tier one, tier one, tier two, and all these relationships. If we want to develop some system and we have these interconnections, it might create some interesting questions. For example, how do we do this testing? Who is responsible for it? The customer, the OEM, or the supplier, tier one, or the supplier of the supplier, tier two? And actually, for this security testing, who does it? Is it the supplier, or is it an independent security lab within the supplier, or is it on a third party independent security lab? Who is responsible if something happens, or how are these updates managed? So, this poses a lot of challenges which might differ from established processes. And this is something that you have to learn in your company what does it mean for your company and your processes to do these cybersecurity requirements. So, finally, some takeaway notes. Implementing ISO 82144 allows you to fulfill upcoming UNEC regulations for cybersecurity system, cybersecurity management systems. Then it's vital that you understand cybersecurity changes because some processes now become a continuous activities. The attacker potential changes over time, and some activities are very different from established practices. For example, testing is very different. I would advise that you get help and support from experts. For example, you can learn about how the standard works in this Automotive Security Active Learning Platform Briscure, or you can check with Secura or with Briscure on how those, does this process of UNEC regulations or 2144, what does it mean for you? So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and then I would like to give the word to Irving for Q&A. So thank you very much, uh, Rafael, Rasmus. Very nice uh, introduction, very nice first webinar. Interesting topic, which also drives quite some questions. Um, but before we start, what we've seen today is that automotive security is a challenging topic, advancing in the right direction, uh, in the right direction, and we're very happy about it. Um, so automotive security, it's clear, requires regulation, standardization, implementation, but also collaboration. Uh, so in the presentation of Brussels, we saw the importance of the UN ECE regulation and what the impact is on the whole automotive industry and how standardization helps to address security in a structured and a scalable way. And our experts, of course, can help uh, you in the implementation and validation of the discussed regulations and standards. Like it's also presented by Rafael, um, who explained how the implementation using the ISO 2144 standard is, is moving forward. Moreover, it contributes also to the same UN ECE regulation and compliance. So through the whole webinar, we saw the collaboration and that that's important. And that's why Secura and Riskier are contributing to the collaboration platform between Michigan and um, the Netherlands. So let's, let's, let's move over to your questions. Um, I saw a couple of questions already coming in. And one of the questions um, that came in is actually related to um, not only the car. So uh, thanks, Johan, for asking a question. Um, it's not only about the vehicle. What about the integration with the roadside systems, traffic management, and the role of the driver? Will there be a global standard initiative on the system? Well, I have an opinion about it. But, um, well, Rafa, you want to start? So, yeah, sure. So, at the moment, there are many efforts to standardize these uh, cybersecurity activities. For example, there are efforts for standardization of this vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to X, so vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to X, it's E to X uh, summarized uh, cybersecurity activities. So, for example, there are some uh, efforts in the lines of uh, common criteria evaluation. So, there are protection profiles being already standardized to define how does security work, for example, between the inter for the interaction between the car elements like telematics unit and the infrastructure. So there are already quite some collaborations and some aspects that are emerging. And this is something that uh, at this moment, they are the first pilot projects. For example, Risker has also pioneered one of these uh, B to X elements uh, evaluation. But yeah, this is something that needs to also integrate and connect with the standard 21434 or other proposals for cybersecurity management. In the end, it's a network of relationships, so everything needs to be up to speed or up to par in cybersecurity. And these pilot projects are now opening these uh, cybersecurity efforts so that the cars are secure in the upcoming developments. Thank you very much. Um, well, indeed, well, Rasman, we are discussing this as well with, uh, for example, the road authorities. Uh, so, what's, what's your opinion about it? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Rafael, for, for, the, for the introduction. Uh, in fact, I actually share uh, the, the first part of your point. Um, well, I share the whole vision, but in particular, the first part when you mentioned about uh, standards and certification schemes like common criteria for 
certifying individual bits of the actual vehicle, so components. That's very true, and that's something very efficient that um, uh, tier uh, tier one and tier two manufacturers can consider for certifying their individual components. Now, from a vehicle point of view, um, I agree. It's not only about a vehicle; it's about the whole uh, the whole ecosystem. So it's uh, vehicle manufacturers, but of course the drivers and and uh, all the national authorities who are in charge of um, um, well roadside uh, 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 science and so on. Um, from a strictly regulation point of view, the one that we have been discussing today about, um, well, the regulation itself asks that the vehicle is able to uh, to protect itself against against those threats. So from that point of view, vehicle manufacturers need to make a complete overview of what are the external interfaces, and vehicle to everything is one of those interfaces, uh, as well as others as well, and uh, well, be able to protect itself against those kind of threats. Uh, it is not assumed that the driver himself will attack the vehicle while driving, but other external uh, uh, parties and, and possible threat factors could be attacking this, uh, this vehicle through the external interfaces. So from that point of view, that's very important. And um, in case the vehicle by itself still leaves a bit of residual risk, then uh, that, that risk needs to be very carefully documented in the sense that the driver, so the owner of the vehicle, is fully aware of what are other particular, let's say, configuration options need to be done in order to block that particular residual risk. And finally, also there's a, the dimension of the supply chain in the sense that the manufacturer itself is obliged to uh, interact further uh, downstream with tier one and tier two and um, be fully aware of what components is integrating into the vehicle and how secure are those components uh, individually. So it's it's about the whole ecosystem, but every part of the ecosystem is, is important in securing the vehicle as a whole. Thank you. And I think on top of that, uh, we are even discussing uh, with, especially with self-driving cars, autonomous cars, how they will get a license. It's also something that the road authorities are working on. So indeed, there are a lot of, a lot of elements that need to be taken into account. Um, there are more questions actually in this topic. Um, and that's more with regards to the standardization. So you talked about 21434. Uh, but we know that within the uh, production industry, within uh, the ICS scalar domain, IEC 62443 is a very important standard. So uh, maybe Rasman has a question to you. How, how does the standard relate to the, uh, the IEC 62443? Very interesting uh, question because IEC 6443, of course, it has multiple parts, but one particular part is about the system. So you can always visualize the vehicle as a, as a huge system with multiple components and multiple interfaces. Um, like I mentioned during one of the slides, there is no mandated way in which you can fulfill the requirements of the regulation. You can do it based on uh, ISO 2144 for the processes, and then for a particular type, you can do it by having inspiration based on IEC 6443, other standards, other best practices, or even, let's say, you follow a free-form uh, approach in which you make yourself a collection of best practices in order to design the vehicle. It's ultimately about how you address this risk and how can you demonstrate to a technical service or to a road authority that you mitigated all these risks. But long story short, um, if um, you have in plan to make use of standards and if you have in plan to make use in particular of, IS, uh, of ISC 6443, uh, the system part of the standard should be a very good uh, starting point to identify general risks and design security controls for your vehicle. Thank you. And any further insights from your end? Yeah, I agree with your points. And in the end, so uh, adopting cybersecurity as a process, so there are many aspects, and every development process in every OEM tier one is going to be different. So you have to make sure that uh, whatever standard you choose, like this uh, IEC or uh, the 2144, so it needs to make sure that you fulfill the requirements. So even if it's full custom, you need to do the right activities to match the risk so that throughout the whole development process, this is managed. And then when you make your product, you know what is the residual risk, everybody agrees. And then if something happens, you can react on it. Thank you. Uh, actually, there are more questions about especially the compliance and the timelines. And, and you, you already said up front, well, one of these questions will always come. Um, so, um, well, let's let's start first with uh, a question with regards to truck and trailer. Uh, the OEMs they are working on CMS, CMS, uh, SMS compliance. Well, we know that that's already happening. Um, so, what what time frame would North America, US, Canada OEMs need to have CMS compliance in place? Yeah. Thank you. A very good question, um, and indeed a question that uh, very often uh, pops up. Uh, first of all, um, there there is one important high level thing that we uh, that we have to clarify. Uh, the regulation is applicable for the markets in which you plan to place or sell your vehicles. 
So if you're uh, if you're American uh, manufacturer, well, uh, U.S. and Canada, they are not under the 1958 agreement. So purely for the U.S. and Canadian market, let's say, as well as other countries, not under this agreement, the regulation will not come into force directly, uh, as mentioned from uh, beginning of 2021. However, if you are an American manufacturer which wants to sell their vehicles in Europe or Asia or any other country under the 1958 agreement, then you have to fulfill those regulations and those requirements because they are mandated for the country and the market in which you, which you wish to place your vehicles. So that being said, um, it doesn't make any difference if you're a truck, uh, trailer or a personal vehicle or motorcycle manufacturer. If your end goal is to place your vehicle in one of the countries governed by this agreement, then you need to, uh, to adjust to the timelines that were indicated in this presentation. And just to recap, the, present, the regulation will go live from next year and it is expected to be uh, mandated for new types from the middle of 2022. Well, so starting actually with a date, how to meet July 2022, uh, because it's mandated by UNEC and um, well, we still have standard like 214434. Uh, in the development, it's still dropped. So um, maybe first your opinion, uh, Rafa? That's that's correct. Uh, that's why I mentioned um, uh, during the presentation that the regulation doesn't mandate for for 244. Um, if it has been so, then I fully agree. We're going to have a, a five-year buffer in between for uh, manufacturers to uh, have time to adapt their processes. 244 is a very good source, as Rafael explained as well. There's um, even you can make a pretty good mapping between 244 and the requirements of the regulation. However, it's not the only way. There are other ways as well. There are other standards. There is also your own way, which could be good enough. So from that point of view, um, uh, well, the regulation will go live. At one point, it will become mandatory. This doesn't mean that until July 2022, all OEMs in the world have to implement ISO 2144 fully. You can also do it like one third of it, one particular part of 2144. So there's no one-to-one -one link between those. There's also room for flexibility in uh, using your own ideas on, on processes. Mm -hmm. Rafael, if you have the... Uh, yeah, so this also to, uh, I agree, and this, it's interesting to highlight that this standard did not happen overnight. So this actually, many of these activities started in 2015, 2016, when there were some very public hacks uh, and remote systems. So here the OEMs and automotive industry started to realize we need to do something about cybersecurity. And the ISO 2144 standard, same as other standards, is basically putting on paper some ideas or best practices in an understandable and standardized way. But companies are already starting to develop these uh, processes internally. So uh, there will be some adaptation time. There will be some time in which, for sure, there will be this requirement for compliance. But at the same time, companies are already shifting towards this. And the importance of this standard, or maybe the relevance of following a standard, is to make sure that your system or your processes are structured in a way that then later you can comply. Does this mean that you will have a full transformation of your company's cybersecurity process? So no, I don't expect that because that's really difficult in automotive uh, processes to change things overnight. But uh, these standards basically, uh, so to, to recap, uh, 2144 or other standards, if you adopt these things, then this is not something that you will do overnight. This is something that is putting a bit more structure what you already have been doing in automotive companies. How does this uh, look? It will be differ per company. So 2144 or the IC standard will have a different aspect in every single company. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Um, well, I, th I think we, we're going to the last question because of time. So if there are more questions, feel free to type them into the question box and, uh, and we will come back to you. Um, um, well, I, we have a couple of closing remarks, uh, but uh, let's start with the last, uh, last question. So what's the best approach uh, with regards to CSMS process for startup OEMs entering into the auto automotive market? So so what's the best approach? How how, how can we make it more practical? Uh, yeah. Who likes to start? Uh, I, 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 will, I, will, I will start and then I will pass it to you, Rafael. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I have to be a bit careful. Um, it's always uh, very tempting and easy to say, well, if you're starting and you start from scratch anyway, you don't have to adapt anything, then how about starting with 2144? But, um, uh, well, even though that's for sure a, a good idea that, that you can consider, once again, um, uh, I will repeat partly my previous answers, it's not the only way. Um, you, can, you can inspire from 244, and if it's, if it's uh, comfortable for you to, uh, to adopt and you don't find it uh, too complex and, and too difficult, uh, that's a straightforward route. And, um, and like I said, there's a very good mapping to a regulation, so the chance of success is pretty high if you go this route. If you find it for any reason, um, uh, well, too challenging or too complex, there are some other ways which, which might be acceptable as well. 
and well, uh, last but not least, it's always advisable to, um, uh, when in doubt, seek assistance from either a local approval authority or a local technical service in, um, well, in, in providing some, some insight into what's the best choice or what's the acceptable way. Yeah. So yeah, uh, my answer is pretty much in line with yours. So for me, the best approach is the one that works. Um, yeah. This is uh, tricky because, uh, of course, following 2144, this is a very good way to follow, to fulfill these requirements and basically end up with a cybersecurity management system. Is this the best way? Well, if we had this answer, if it is the best way, then I can also imagine that UNEC or regulations already would point to this is the way. However, there are many approaches because processes in automotive companies can differ quite a lot. So these, you have to choose the approach that works best and fits best your company so that you can effectively adopt it. Therefore, uh, 2144 is a good example. Yes, it is the only one. So there are many options. The one that works best in, in um, if you're aligned with the technical authorities, with the regulations, then it's 2144 is a good approach. But if you find something that fits better your uh, company, then you can also uh, uh, follow it. So that's why I would advise to consult with security experts to see what works best for your company. Well, I think that's very clear. Well, the compliance is there, uh, well, at least the, 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 the regulation is there, and, and we know what to comply with and we know what the timelines are. Uh, the discussion of the standardization is especially about okay, how can those standards help you to implement to make it scalable and i think that's very clear in both 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 your stories um and of course that might raise a lot of questions but we're here to to help you on that and and uh, well feel free to to contact us and to get guidance about this uh, this topic so we're getting to an end because uh, it's already over the hour uh we start a little bit later um so um so let's let's close off uh, of course if there are more questions we will come back to it um but first of all, thanks for all the attendees. We had more than um, more than 100 attendees um, uh, during the webinar. Uh, lots of interesting topics, lots of interesting um, questions as well. Um, the next webinar that will be held in September, and it's also about automotive security, and it's more conversation about testing, evaluation, and what the industry trends are. And it will be hosted by Grim. Um, some of you asked already, okay, can we get the slides? Can we get the video of this uh, this recording? Yes, the link to the recording will be emailed to you so that you can, well, get back to the topic. And if there's any question left, uh, feel free to contact us. So thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, André. Thanks, Carleen. Thanks, Raphael and Rathvan. And everybody who helped this webinar to uh, get it well organized. If there's any feedback, please feel free in the comments. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a great evening.